Big Gab, episode 316, the show for working musicians for Monday, August 23rd, 2021. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to the show by for and about working musicians welcome back welcome to the show our sponsor for this episode is ultimate ears pro where they have their here at live promotion that gets you money off several of their uh custom fit options we'll talk about the details of that in a little bit but you're going to want to hear about it for now here at the moment in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in napomo california it's paul kent how goes it mr kent I just got back from a, a whirlwind. My first four gigs in a row, three house record gigs, one, one uh, uh, solo gig. The last one was a solo gig. And it, there was so much going on that I want to share with you. Sure. And the, the big thing I want to talk to you about is, is setup time, right? Oh, man. <laughs> well, okay. No, I have, I have my own. This is great. It, this dovetails with something I have on my list, too. So go. Yep. All right, so gig one, a gig we've done for years at a nice winery, our sound system, our sound guy, our sound guy's best helper, we walk in, it's butter, 15, 20 minutes of, of, uh, of, of some tweaking of stuff, Sure. One, one song just to triple check, and we were off and running, and it was a beautiful night, awesome night. That's great. Night two um, we is about an hour and a half from where night one was. And it was one of those, I don't know how to describe it. They look like gigantic trailers that kind of open up into a stage. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've seen the, the, like the, the long side of it opens into a stage. Exactly. Yep. I've played um, on those and, before. They're, they're, it's actually and, a great little, in, you know, invention. It's a portable stage in that sense. Well, sort of. So th <laughs> this one, which was a very, very good one, like, like, you know, sound baffling stuff on oh. the ceiling and on the, and on the, the back wall. I was going to say, that's the only problem with those is, is they become very weirdly tuned speakers that amplify all the wrong things, but there you go. So, yep. so we get into setup on this, on the second gig and, um, our, our bass player notices that's an awful lot of subwoofers for this type of gig. I bet these people do a lot of DJ gigs, mm. you know, and, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of low end. Uh, and then a, a, a brand of, uh, you know, flying arrays on each side of the stage that I didn't see, light, um, you know, r mounts in front, of, coming off the top of the stage as well. Sure. Anyway, uh, the sound company, we had sent twice our stage plot. And as is often the case, uh, they don't even look at it until they get to the show, which is a, yep. a sad thing. And I, yeah, I, it happens. I send, it, it, when it, I I'm send always, it, I'm it, the um, I, Bitter Pill gets asked for this, and we've been asked for it all summer. And I always know who has looked. We have a built in litmus test unintentionally. And it's that I have moved with Bitter Pill for the most part from using three toms, two racks and a floor, to two toms, one rack and a floor. But our stage plot has not been updated. And when the sound engineer comes over and says, ah, you know, where is Tom number two? That's when we know they've paid attention and, and we should be good to go. for the night. <laughs> So, yep, yeah. I, I know. Yep. But it's not always. So, right. And and Bill actually does a good job of, of trying to advance for us. Right. Yeah. So he'll call. And in this case, they were like, you know, got it. You know, we'll look at it. We'll talk about it on site. Right. And Bill's like. I'm just letting you know, and this is also in the email when I send the stage plot, 10 piece band, a lot of moving parts, a lot of wireless, um, you know, please, See, please pay attention. This is why Van Halen put the, remove the Brown M&Ms in their rider. Sure. It's exactly it. like that. Like our, my second Tom has now turned into the Brown M&M, right? Like if, if we have them looking for the second Tom, that's the same litmus test as the Brown M&M. They've, they've looked through everything. So there you go. Beautiful. Yeah. You and, need, and actually, you need a, you need a Brown M&M. Clause. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the interesting thing is I often recommend, like, especially when we do festivals where there's like a 30 minute or 45 minute, 30 minute is typical changeover. If they're going to provide, you know, certain things, they need to be set and ready to just put on stage because oh, we've got yeah. a lot of. Yeah. All right. Anyway, 
Gig number two, the problems we're running into are largely wireless. So we have, all our horns have wireless mics, that's five. All our horns have wireless in-ears, that's 10. I have a wireless guitar, 11. Simon has a wireless guitar and wireless in-ears, that's 13. Um, Chris now has wireless guitar and wireless in-ears. Anyway, the problem is typically some of our horns have these Samson wireless units that constantly need scanning. I guess the Shure units, as, as it's been described to me by Chris, um, the Shure units are constantly looking for you know open channels and, and, and open frequencies, and, and they're they're they'll, constantly scanning to keep themselves healthy, right? They'll jump around. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. I don't, it doesn't seem like the Samsons do, and so we'll all of a sudden get some weird squelchy noise or something like that, and it, we have to go rescan the unit. You, take, you have to take the transmitter and the receiver, put them next to each other and, you know, look for, they, they have some process by which they look for free channels. Anyway, this is, this is folks is why people recommend you use the same brand wireless yeah. stuff in the, in your band, like homogenize on a brand and go with it. Yep. It's because of so, this. Yeah. So solving those wireless problems as we're trying to get through with a sound crew that doesn't know us try that, you know, with a new environment and the environment is clearly going to be part of the equation here. Right? right. So all those subs, the floor is shaking. If I touch my lips to the microphone, I can feel every note the bass player is playing. I mean, oh. it was, it was vibrating that bad and you know, it was going to be loud, you know, cause it's, it's moderately self-contained. Um, uh, you know, the sound goes off the ceiling, even though there's the baffling, it yeah, does, yeah, yeah. you know, it comes back down. Anyway, we've seen this type of thing before and we're somewhat kind of, uh, you know, aware of it. It's yep. a huge area, you know, uh, the amps can get up a little bit, but it doesn't matter. All I heard all night, all I felt all night was bass and all I heard all night were cymbals. Right. And um, it was, it was a, a challenge to just be comfortable and we just kind of, you know, laughed about it. But the stress of the wi solving the wireless problems ate up a ton of the short amount of time. Five, they called for a 5.30 sound check for a 6.30 downbeat. And I would say till about 6.10, 6.15, they were troubleshooting Wi-Fi problems yeah. to get the horn set up. Uh, you know, because one would go into sync and then another one would start causing problems. And, and you know, it, it was really... So we had about 20 minutes to chase stuff down. And... You know, again, new environment, new. It, the gig went fine, but it wasn't comfortable, right? right and right, that, right, they, right. Oh, the audience videos I saw, the sound out front was quite good. So, okay, cool. Uh, the next gig is a early afternoon gig. It's a three thirty gig, and um, a guy who has worked with us before. Um, but again, we have. There's maybe on the schedule about an hour to get us on stage and sound check. So, you know, the load in time is part of that as well, right? Right. So this one, we're having uh, a weird problem with uh, a monitor. Uh, Russ is the drummer's monitor. Um, he's now using in-ears and he has a little mixer. Signal would go to a hardwired monitor when we tried that, but for some reason wasn't going through his mixer. Whatever sure. it was, it was. Yep. It was a real, I was in the direct sun. It was a really hot day. My monitors, I think due to heat, finally you know, flaked out about two thirds of the way oh. through the gig. Short set, 90 minute set, but uh, again, no time for a, 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 a warm up song or a sound check song. It was literally a line check, and we go. Yeah. And this one was actually kind of frustrating. You know, it was frustrating. We were tired. Uh, it was, I was in the direct sun. Some of the guys were in the direct sun. Um, sound on stage because we never, we never really got to balance stuff. And, you know, they were on a tight time schedule, so we had to go. Right. I came off and I talked to the guy who was mixing us, whose sound company it was. And I said, you know, man, I just don't think we can do it this way anymore. I think we need at least a guarantee of an hour of sound check time. And I want, and then I was talking to Bill about it afterwards. And I said, I think we also have to build in the band should get 15 minutes to just chill before we go on stage. Right. And so this, that's, means a, that's that 15 minutes is a, it, I, it's funny. You mentioned that. I was remembering the very first time I did not get that 15 minutes. And it just the other day I had this image and this was, goes all the way back to, I believe my freshman, maybe sophomore year of high school. And I was playing with the jazz band and we had to load in and it was literally, we were playing at some other school 
or maybe it was a church. I don't remember, but it was like a, a building where lots of offices and people, but also a performance space. So it could have been a school or a church. And we weren't on a stage. We were set up like on a floor somewhere in what felt like a cafeteria. And we had to lug the drums in like down this long hallway. And it was, you know, it was, and of course we got there and there was only a limited amount of time. So it was like lugging everybody, the whole, the whole band. And, you know, which was probably a 30 piece band at that point. It was a school jazz band and, uh, and the drums and everything. I finally like brought the last drum in, sat it down and like sat down at the kit to organize things. And the band director looks at me and he says, you ready? I'm like, wait, what? Like, I, <laughs> we always get like five minutes, you know, like I, I, I still haven't gone to pee or anything. And, and I think I said that to him, like, I haven't peed yet. He's like, yeah, but we got to go. I'm like, oh, that sucks. And, and then we did it. You know, you know, we we had a bitter pill gig recently. I think I talked about it on the show where that same kind of thing happened where we just, you know, set up and went. And um, it's you never like, I don't know. I'm not used to that. It, like you normally get somewhere between five and 60 minutes, you know, depending on the, the scenario. But usually there's something where you can like, you know, get a drink, pee, collect yourself, take the stage, not set up your crap and play immediately. Monkey boy. Right. Like, that, which is what that felt like that day. I was like, Oh man. Yeah. 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 Well, we had it two days in a row and and, and that yeah. was part of the frustration. So, yeah. you know, it was stressful, hard to get into the gig the second night, the third day, you know, it was stressful and hard to get into the gig and then stuff was failing because the sun and heat might have some amp problems or pedal board problems. Yeah. So it was enough. And I kind of walked off stage and I said to the guy, I said, you know what? Love working with you. And you, you know, I know front of house probably sounded great, but we're a 10 piece band with it. You know, it's pretty complex setup. You know, we need time. And my concern is I want the best product out there. I want yeah. the band to perform its best. I know you'll make whatever we put out there sound good, but you know, on the supply side, right. <laughs> you know, we need, we need some things. So anyway, he was like, well, you know, that's going to rule out, you know, festival gigs. Cause those are usually a 30 minute turn. Yeah. I said, I get it. Anyway, walk away, have the conversation thinking about it all through the weekend. And, I'm, and then I call my sound guy and I, who's, you know, was there at the other two gigs. He's always with us and he's trying to, He's trying to navigate third party sound companies and, yep. you know, work with them. And he's really good at like offering his services. He's like an extra free body that the sound company, they love having him there. Right. Yeah. So I said, I said, that's you know, a smart, is- that's a smart way to, cause there's always that negotiation, right? If you, cause your band, whether you bring your own sound engineer with you, like you do, or, or if you just have your institutional knowledge of sound, like for example, for me, the, the, and I and I use this all the time because it's a great way to sort of step into a f- f- unknown engineer's good graces because that's the trick is you want to be there to help and you know a lot of information that they need but you don't want to tell them that they don't know anything in, in the wrong way right so it's it's this negotiation I always I, I I mean it comes out of my mouth without me even thinking about it but I have. Years ago, when I had the my bass drum, my Eames uh, drum set built, I had Joe McSweeney put a D1, an AKG D112, the sort of one of the standard kick drum mics. I had him build it inside my bass drum using the May mic mounting system. It's freaking awesome. And it's great because there's no mic stand needed. There's no nobody to kick it over. You know, on the stage, you just plug literally plug an XLR into the side of the bass drum and it's done. It's right where it should be. You know, all that good stuff. And it sounds great. But if I tell a sound engineer the wrong way, if I just say, hey, there's a D112 in my kick, they may interpret that as he's telling me what to do. Right. You know, or they might interpret it as it's meant to be, which is helpful. And so I've learned to say to them, hey, just so you know, and this is an option for you do whatever you want with your gear. Uh, but there is a D one twelve in my kick. If you want to use it and that, if you want to use it is the key that I've learned the hard way smart. over the years. So right. Smart. Well, I mean, it's, it's thank you, but I wish I had thought of it the first time I said it, not, you know, the fifth <laughs> time, uh, it, it was definitely, you know, iterative design, uh, in terms of the delivery process. But, but now I know how to say this to people that a, they take it the right way every time and B it opens the door to, Oh, Hey, by the way, here's another thing I know about our band and, and how the sound is going to be. And here's another thing. And like the mic that I use in my Cajon now, this buyer dynamic mic, which it clamps on and is great. And I put it in my pitch slap. It's fantastic. It's the right form factor 
it is the wrong EQ pattern, right? This is a mic for toms, not for inside a cajon. And I say it exactly that way so I can be a little self-deprecating, but also show some knowledge, right? Like, hey, you're going to you're probably going to want to put the disco smile on this mic and take a lot of mid range out because you ain't going to be happy with it otherwise. And they're always like, oh, hey, thanks for the heads up, you know, and and you can start doling out information. And I've sort of learned the right order in which to start, you know, because I'm on stage for a while setting up my drums. And so it's just like every few minutes, it's like, oh, hey, you might want this little nugget of information or this little nugget of wisdom. Sure. Right. But, you know that becomes helpful. And I'm sure Bill has figured out the same kind of thing. But for those of you listening in your bands, you need to figure out how to navigate that initial introduction so that you can be helpful and actually help the band sound better without this, the house engineer completely shutting you out and hating you and just wanting to get to the end of the gig. So that's right. Right. Yeah. All right. So, so here's how the story comes around. So I'm thinking about the, you know, frustration of the last, the two, last two gigs. Yeah. I did a solo acoustic gig on Sunday, just me and my bows. Life is lovely. Took it easy. Actually took breaks in a solo gig, which I usually don't do. And, you know, and I had a nice long drive home to kind of think about stuff. So I called Bill and I said, all right, what did we learn about the last two gigs and what, what do we need to do to mitigate things? And he says, well, you know, we kind of talked through a few of these things, but Bill was kind of um, of the opinion that, it could always be something, and it somewhat is the nature of the beast. There's so many variables; things are going to be different all the time. That's right. He's not wrong, right? Like, well, it, there, well, it is hold, hold always going to be something. Hold on. So, sort of. So, I'm thinking about this, and then Chris, the guy who's subbing on bass for us now, um, is actually a Wi-Fi engineer, really bright guy. Sure. Right. I called him and I said, you know, is it the nature of the beast? He goes, you know, I'm going to reject that. He said, he said, I don't think. You, you can say that you can't do a 30-minute load-in. He goes, think of every festival gig you ever have seen. That's 30 minutes between bands. And, you know, there is a process and a way to do that. You know, we have to stack the, the deck in our, in our favor. And so he went on with regards to the Wi-Fi problems and, you know, was saying, you know, yes, the different, the different brands are a trouble spot that, that you, we can smooth over and make it easier. If everybody gets these kind of channel hopping yeah. you know, you know, uh, not Wi-Fi, but a wireless, yeah. um, you know, tools that will make a difference. Uh, and so we kind of talked through all the type of stuff, but the really interesting and I think salable point was, yes, you know, when you play Lollapalooza or Bonnaroo or any of this stuff, bands are changing over with, you know, often some serious technical demands with 30 minutes. The question should be, how do we get our band ready? Because, you know, you know, I don't want to take a certain category of gigs out of our possibilities, right? right. Just because right. because we're so special, right? I'd rather be able to take gigs. And, uh, you know, the technology shouldn't be the prohibiting thing to taking the gigs, right? Oh, in fact, so, it should help you, <laughs> right? Well, like, well, Dan Meblin had a great solution for that, right? They use a... Um, Oh, I forget what mixer it is. I think it's one of the Behringer's or the Midas, you know, in the 32 series or whatever it is for, for the pop fiction, that band that, that he's in. And they bring their rack with uh, whatever they call them, split tails, right? To every gig. And they plug their entire stage into their rack. And then they let the front of house engineer take all of the outputs from that to whatever they want for front of house. So they have complete control from the split tails and they can do their own gains and all that stuff. But monitors, everything else is automatic and exactly the same for that band every single gig. And it saves them a ton of headache because yep. there's, because you're not trying to integrate with another system. You're literally saying, yeah, here's all your inputs. Just go take them. And, and they're yours now. Great. Which is an interesting, yep. it, it takes some work to, to, set that up. But like you said, you're stacking the deck, st stacking the deck. Sure. You're stacking the deck in your favor. That's <laughs> what I'm going to say. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm holding with that. I'm strong and wrong, man. I'm sticking with it. Yeah. So anyway, that, that was, that was my week is, is one butter gig, one new company, challenging sound left you a little bit like, Oh, you know, yeah, we went over great, but man, if, if, if we could have had everything going our way, we would have really killed long drive, you know, earlier than usual gig the next day where it's still kind of on your mind and, and you're still kind of like, uh, and then you kind of go right into load in setup sound check issues yeah. and the cumulative effect of the frustration, no sound check, 
hot sun, you know, all this type of stuff. And then, you know, a, a, a challenging thing. So you start to analyze and say, how do we, how do we run our business better? How do we, how do we take care of stuff? And I, I like that answer that um, it's the nature of the beast. It, you know, that doesn't mean we can't, we can't iterate on some of the things that are causing us problems. And you can't stick stuff. the deck. Yeah. You can stick the deck, man. That's yeah. what you're going to do. That's right. Yep. Right. And then, you know, I, I was really pleased that my voice held out well. So nice. Nick, Nick, Nick heard his voice on the third gig and uh, he kind of had to bail on several gig, on several songs. And I kind of picked him up while pretty dried out and sitting in the sun. You know, I powered through and also just, the vibe was harder getting the audience going. Again, it was, it was a warmer day people. And it was also these outdoor gigs. People are self self spacing now, social distancing, and they're not all up at the stage like they usually are. And so that energy isn't quite there. Mm. This was a big, big uh, kind of field area and people were kind of really scattered out. So it was kind of hard to get it going. And it really took almost 70% of the gig before I could see the people all the way around. It, it was a, it was a big circular pavilion yep. and I could kind of see the circle kind of coming alive and, you know, getting in and call and response and that type of thing. But it, it took a, you know, a lot of work and a lot of energy and, you know, a refocusing through um, but anyway, so I had, you know, picked up some extra, you know, songs to sing. And, uh, I think I told you the first gig we did back, I sang improperly, caught a cold, blew my voice out and was done for, you know, about 10 days. Yeah. And I was worried like over the course of, over the course of COVID, have I picked up bad habits and am I screaming instead of singing? And, you know, am I not using my instrument right? And I was worried about that. But then, you know, the next couple of gigs, it seemed to be fine. And then this was a good test, like three, you know, pretty long gigs. You know, two of them were three hour gigs. One of them was just a 90 minute gig. Yeah. And then the acoustic gig went really, really well. And so a lot of lessons learned, thoughts about the technology that we use, how to, you know, smooth over your rough edges to make your load ins. And I guess the biggest thing is, again, why would I want to take a certain category of gigs out just because our technology isn't there, right? You know what? You can fix the technology. It. That's the beauty of it. That's right. Yeah. Like technology can can be the thing that helps you here. And and that I think that's the lesson from this is really taking a minute and looking at okay, where are the trouble spots, right? And you're not going to be able to solve for all of them. I mean, maybe you could, but it would be probably economically unfeasible, right? But you can solve for the most common ones and the ones that that are easy to solve for and and get yourself there. And once the band it will take an adjustment though. Once, you know, it it'll take a gig or 3 or 5 for the band to get into the new routine, but once you're in it and especially if you can get the whole band to sort of you know, you don't necessarily need the whole band setting up the PA, but if everybody knows where their input goes, and here's what happens with your microphone. Well, that takes the load off of, and it, you know, it's that whole division of labor thing, right? You, you can go faster if you've got everybody participating at the same time. And nobody, if somebody's standing around waiting, and we went through this in Fling years ago uh, and probably need to go through it again, uh, which I'll tell, I'll tell the story in a minute, but we went through it in years ago and, you know, we, we noticed, oh, well, these two guys are finished with whatever they have on their plates and then there's three other people that are still working for another 30 minutes. Like, well, wait, we can cut that down to 15 minutes if we delegate some of these other things to those two guys. And so we did. And, it, you know, it took a few gigs. And with a mix of technology and divisional labor, we had it so that Fling could show up with our cars outside with all the stuff in our cars and be playing in less than an hour with time to breathe before we went on stage. And it, it just took, you know, it takes some intention and it takes everybody committed to being a part of that solution, um, which is, which may or may not be the most difficult part here. One part of your solution, though, could be your in-ear monitors. And if you get everybody on in-ears, then you don't need to worry about wedges. And that's where our sponsor comes in, Ultimate Ears Pro. As I said earlier, to celebrate the return of live music they have this promotion now called Hear It Live, and their goal is to get everyone ready to get back out playing, back out on tour, back doing your gigs. The promo started yesterday, Sunday the 22nd, and runs through Monday the 13th, so you've got to act on this, but you get tons of discounts here. The UE Lives, 
right? The, the, these are all their custom fits. The UE lives, you get 500 bucks off the UE 18 plus 400 bucks off the UE 11s. The ones I use 300 bucks off. You've got to go check this out because these folks know what they're doing and they want you to be successful. They want to help you solve the problems that you're having and their stuff is going to be able to help you hear better without having to worry about running cables for monitor wedges and making your stage louder and all of that stuff. And you get to protect your hearing at the same time, which is kind of a big deal to me. So I'm, I appreciate what they're doing again, though. You got to make sure you go now to pro.ultimateears.com because this thing only runs from now through September 13th. And so you got to go take advantage of this right now. Our thanks to Ultimate Ears for doing this whole promotion and for sponsoring this episode. So I mentioned Fling, Paul. Um, we have uh, we are doing a a barn gig. It's a private gig that's open to friends and family and and followings of three bands that are playing. Fling's one of them. Bitter Pill is actually another one. And then uh, our friends in the church ladies uh, are also playing. So three original bands uh, were playing at a uh, barn here in Durham that we've played at uh, before, but it's been a while. In fact, I was looking today as we were prepping the show, the last time fling played a public played a gig. I don't want to say a public gig. The last time fling played a gig was almost two years ago, 22 months ago, November 9th, 2019. So, or it will have been 22 months by the time September 11th comes around. So, we are not the well-oiled machine I just described earlier here in the episode. The one that knows how to set everything up and just does it automatically. It can get from cars to downbeat in less than an hour. That band doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it, it exists in our memories. Also, the thing that has changed is that this gig on the 11th will be Fling's first gig where everybody in the band is on in-ears. Therefore, it's also the first gig where the guitar players, the two guitar players and bass player are all going direct with sans amps. So PA, no amps on stage. This is probably the, the worst time to do this, right? But it, but arguably maybe the best time. Cause we aren't, we certainly don't have old habits to, uh, to, to contend with, right? We, we just, we have new habits to develop, but we won't have a whole lot of time to set up. We will have, maybe 90 minutes to get from, you know, pulling in to ready to play. And then of course we have to be ready for the other bands. So uh, we're doing, it's with our own sound, but uh, we will be using Mike. I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Mike bought some of those E30 speakers, the, um, yeah, the towers. Yep. yep. And, uh, and so this will be the first gig using those as mains. I'm very excited about it. They're very capable speakers. I've been wanting to use them for a very long time, but you know, the first time out, you learn some things that are valuable for the second and third and 15th times out. And so we get to learn all of this at once. Uh, the I suppose the good news from the PA standpoint is we will, it's not just us playing. So we will be able to work with the PA and, and really sort things out, not just during sound check, but, you know, as, because I'll probably wind up mixing the church ladies and somebody else will wind up mixing bitter pill. Cause I play yeah, obviously in that band, but, um, but we'll be able to get things set up, but it'll just be, I sent a note out to the guys today. I'm like, Hey, let's just all look this square in the eye and know what it is we've gotten ourselves into and what we're doing. It's a pretty yeah. forgiving environment, right? It's not super high stakes. Um, you know, it's not, it's not like we're playing some big stage at a festival and, and, you know, everybody there is, is there for exactly what this is. And of course, hopefully it'll happen. Um, our hosts are, are requesting that we, uh, pass along that they are mandating people to be vaccinated at, uh, if they're coming to this gig, all the, the all the bands have to be vaccinated and all the guests have to be vaccinated. Uh, but even with that in mind, they, they may choose or any one of us in any of the bands may choose. Yeah, I don't wasn't want to be in a barn, you know, indoors in, in September. It's a big barn, but it is indoors. And so, you know, it's it's entirely possible that this thing doesn't happen because uh, we've been seeing that. I, I, I don't know about in your area, but oh, you I think you said you had one gig that was pulled because of COVID concerns, right? Yeah, we actually had a big festival that was pulled and that's the first one. And I, and actually I'm living with waiting for the phone to ring for other ones to yeah, happen. It's, it's definitely just... happening. Yeah. And we're seeing it a lot around here. We're seeing national tours, right? Get, get pulled out. For sure. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, 
I am, I, I had not taken a single gig this summer for granted. I had not taken a single opportunity to see live music for granted this summer. And now I feel like, you know, we're just racing against the clock here at some point it's we're, we're locking down again at some level. It, certainly with live music being far more limited, but I am very thankful. Let me put it that way for all of the live music experiences I've had this summer, both playing and seeing because um, I missed it as I know we all did. So, yeah, yeah. we, um, so I'm curious. I'll, I'll of course share as we, as we get closer, but, um, but yeah, this, this fling gig has me, it's, I'm a little anxious about just, you know, I'll be fine once we're all set up and we actually hear how it's going to sound on stage. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. but <laughs> it's just, this is, there's a lot of firsts for us here, which will be a little bit interesting. And I, I think I might be the only one in the band that has played out since that, since two years ago. So it, it's that it, it's not just that the band hasn't played out. Um, it's that I think four fifths of us have not played a gig s- since November 19. So, wow. Yeah, it's a. I mean, it's a long time to go. I know my first. I mean, we talked about it here on the shows. You know, my first gigs out were like I was okay. Let me make sure I still have all the stuff I need to set up my drums. Do my, you know, does all my hardware work? What broke? What, you know, <laughs> what what's not there? All those questions that you just sort of take for granted when you're gigging. You know, three or four times a month. That those questions have to be answered. Like, what did I what did I pull out of that case to use six months ago? that I don't want to right. find out about when I'm 90 minutes from the house or whatever. Thankfully this gig is, you know, 10 minutes from my house at most, but still like, you know, it's interesting. Um, I had, uh, we had a bitter pill rehearsal this weekend, uh, which is rare for us, especially with all the gigs that we've been playing. But what a wonderful thing it was. There's one original that uh, we've been, we've been playing uh, Jesus going to pay my tab that we've played it. I don't know, four or five shows now that I had never played other than on stage. Uh, I learned the song from a rough demo recording and including singing the harmonies and we just figured it out and made it work. Uh, but it was nice to, to, you know, play that song. And of course, cause I have, you know, as I mentioned, logic on my Mac is our mixer here in the studio. So I was able to uh, multi-track record several different, segments of our rehearsal which meant we walked away with three songs two of them were brand new to the band and all three of them are just killer I, it's such a pleasure working with like really world-class songwriters man like these are these songs are all number one hits they're so catchy they're so oh man it's so good i can't wait to play we've been playing jesus but uh, the other two we have we have not played and i can't wait to play them so i'm hoping awesome yeah, I'm hoping the gigs work, but what a pleasure it is, you know, to have some of that, that COVID work that I did re completely rejiggering the studio, totally paying off for just like, oh, hey, let's just record this and sure. And th- then we have a record of it. It's like, oh yeah, it actually sounds really good. That's real cool. <laughs> or it sounds good, but it needs this, like being able to to hear that right away and then sort of, you know, be honest about, oh, okay, we should change this little part of it and tweak it. You know, it, it helps that be efficient, which is good, I think. So, yep. I get yeah. Hey, I have an idea for you. So, yeah, you know, we, we stay in touch with our friends who do some of the other cover band advice things. So, you know, cover band central, cover band confidential. Oh, and by the way, we really do need to send best wishes out to our friend Steve Witchell at cover band central, who is recovering from COVID. I think he's on the mend. He, it was kind of touch and go and scary for him a while, but yeah. we need to send Steve some love and, you know, and uh, put the good vibes in the air that he'll recover completely. Um, anyway, my, my thought is this. It's so funny to me that uh, the common arguments, common discussions, if you will, common passion points, if you will, uh, <laughs> that people have, you know, so much of these discussions are about band dress, yep. cargo shorts, band pay, um, and using iPads or, you know, or lyric, you know, sheets on stage, right? Every one of these sites, including, you know, we certainly spent enough cycles on that. Yep. Seem to be it. I'm particularly fascinated about this concept of band pay because there, as I read what people share in other places and when I talk to people, um, you know, a couple themes, you know, start to emerge, but I wonder what the reality is. And so I was thinking maybe we could take the bull by the horns here and do a survey 
and see if we can get people to participate and just kind of see what do bands get paid in different areas. What do they get paid for bar gigs? What do they get paid for casuals and you know privates? Um, for how many band members do they do they negotiate? You know, one thing that that strikes me often is when I watch these threads, people will say, "Well, around here they only pay this." To which you know many people respond. They will only pay that unless you ask for something else, right? right. Unless you yeah. unless you negotiate. So if you're saying the the local bars only pay this, um, you know, and you're willing to take that because it's better than not having a gig, um, you that's, know, that's I guess different it's a decision. than than saying that that's the that's the rate, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's the offered rate. Uh, but yeah, no, I like this idea about doing a little survey for it. You, Paul, you said you're going to like dig into survey monkey and put something together that we can share out with everybody. Yeah, I think I'd like to do that. And we can kind of, you know, slap it on our, on our, when we get the results and we tabulate it and figure out what yeah. it means. Um, I think it'd be a good project. I think it'd be useful and helpful. Again, you know, we have this basic premise in, in being, you know, what we are, the weekend warrior, semi-professional to, you know, professional, in that there are people who, and it doesn't exist. Like you don't get plumbers who say, I just need a gig. And so I'll do it for nothing or I'll do it, you know, for exposure or I'll do it. So my girlfriend can come watch me. You know, you don't, you don't have that with other trades, right? No, so, no, we're, and, we're, we're putting a new roof on our house. And so I'm, I'm well aware of how my decision as to what I want to pay for this does not really impact what the cost is going to be. Right. Right. So, I mean, yep. I, like I, they, the, the people that are doing the work tell me what the, what the price is going to be. And it varies a little bit, you know, and, and obviously you get some quotes and do your thing and make a decision. But, you know, we don't start this by saying we're going to pay somebody a thousand dollars to put a roof on our house. Like that would be awesome, you know, but that's not how this process works. It shouldn't yep. work that way when we play. <laughs> I don't know. I agree. Yeah. So anyway, um, I think. I think a, a more kind of like strategic look into money, what's made, who's yeah. making it, you know, what's the deal. And it might be even interesting to hear how do professionals in various, you know, people who derive their income from music. Yeah. Do they just do battle with the semi-professionals and, you know, just get hostile to them? Do they try and explain to them the value of upholding the value of the music that we play, you know, and, and do they try and coach them? I think it'd just be really fascinating to see who does what in different parts of the country might be informative, might help people, might encourage some people to, you know, relook at, you know, what they feel that their value is. Again, yeah. I, I, I firmly believe that, that one of the fundamental problems is there's a lot of people who just do it for fun and are happy to, you know, do it for very little money. Um, because, they don't see it as a financial transaction or, 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 you know, really think about the implications well, that's of what the, that does to the That's the issue is it's, it's not, you know, when I'm hiring somebody to put a roof on my house, that, that is a business transaction, right? It, like everybody in the equation is only looking at it from a business standpoint. Now, hopefully the person that, that puts that, you know, the, the person that we hire is someone that at some level enjoys and takes pride in their work and all of that stuff. Like that's great but it is a business transaction. And the same thing is true when we go play music in you know, in a place that is making money, uh, very different from, you know, playing in your basement and having a couple of friends over. Those are, those are two different things, right? They and are. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm eager to see us get this survey out there and uh, start seeing your, your results, but you can't vote yet because the survey doesn't exist. But Paul, Paul is the yeah. man. He is going to make. I'll it spend happen. some time over the week, and you know, cool. we'll just ask some quick questions and yeah. and uh, make it painless to participate. But it'll be fun to kind of share out and just kind of see what really is happening. I like it, and I and I actually it would be interesting to hear if there are people who are like, I didn't I didn't invent this market. I mean, you know, if I want to play for free, I should be able to play for free. It'd be interesting to hear if people have yeah. some kind of principled position that they want to share for that. So uh, let's learn from each other. I like it. I also, I have a thing I'm trying to solve. I did a, um, what, what I believe is the second to last madhouse this week. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with sound, right? Like I, I always want things to sound good. And a lot of that is awareness from the stage, but a lot of it is, you know, what does that translate to? And I'm always listening whenever, whenever I listen to recordings, like even audience recordings at gigs, 
I'm always listening. Okay, how was the blend? And I know that there's so much compression and weird EQ because of both both software and just the hardware of where the microphone is on cell phones that you are not getting a fully accurate representation. But you you'd get you get a, a sense of it, especially if you listen over time, you start to especially if you listen to recordings that you've made. Like if I make a recording of another band, it's like, ah, I know what that translates to. So I get a pretty good sense. And it, it's a weird thing that, you know, I always try to have uh, the drums not be the you know the loudest thing. And it's easy for them to be the loudest thing. If I just you know want to hit real hard or, or use loud drums or whatever, then then they could be the loudest thing. But, I you know, I want the blend to be good. I want all the instruments heard. I especially want the vocals heard and all that stuff. And I was listening to some audience recordings as I, as I do from, from that last one here. And I, and it was weird. My, and this has happened in that, in that room before it's fairly unique to that room. Uh, I suppose it's unique. It's either unique or it's not unique, right? This is a binary thing. There's no degrees <laughs> of uniqueness. I've explained that on this show before. And here I am falling into this fairly common, uh, fairly rare elsewhere, but, but um, that room lies to me on stage. My snare drum is much louder in the house than it is on stage. And I think part of it is it's got like super high ceilings and, and, and there's like scaffolding and lighting and, and even some baffles up there now. So you, you're not getting reflection down, which is where a lot of that sort of feedback, the audible feedback comes from uh, when you're on stage, but it is, you know, a wooden stage. And there's often a wooden wall or some sort of flat reflective surface wall behind me. And so that broadcasts it out. But it's it's been really interesting listening and hearing my snare drum like like three times as loud as it as it was to me on stage or was to anybody on stage. And it's like, ah, I want to solve this problem. So I'm I'm researching because, you know, I'm I'm obsessed about having good sound. And and that mean that starts with me. But, you know, I'm the person that brings multiple snare drums to a gig and listens to them. Uh, I bring different symbols to a gig and listen to them because you have to make your instrument. The room is part of your instrument. I suppose that's really the the lesson that I'm trying to say here. I'm also looking if anybody has any thoughts or anything, you, you know, send them to us feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I'd love to love to hear your thoughts on on this. I found the other day I I on stage. It felt like if I tuned my snare drum down things were, uh, you know, things were more in, in, uh, in balance. That was entirely the wrong thing to do. It made it worse, um, out in the house, which I just find fascinating. You know, it's, so I'm, I'm working on trying to solve this problem. It's really what it is. I, and again, it's, you know, I, 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 like we have like, I think one more of these gigs there or whatever, and I'm sure I'll play, but you know, other things there or whatever, but, um, but I'm always just like, you know, what is it about this room and what can I learn so that when I go into an unknown room that I have a little bit of, of, you know, history experience that I can draw on to, to get the right sound. Um, so anyway, it's just been an interesting little thing. I, I, I will link to, there was a, there's a face, there's many Facebook drummers groups, as you might imagine. I, uh, I will link to my post in the Facebook drummers group that I posted this into, uh, which has already a great discussion. I learned about some things I had no idea about. Th there's this product called the big fat snare drum. Uh, I, I, and it's, it's like, it looks to be like a drum ring that you'd put, you know, uh, just on the, on the top of the drum, but it's much, it, it's, it's, it's bigger than that and has some other things. And people say it really helps dry out, a drum, especially in a scenario like this. So I, I, you know, I ordered one, I think it was, I don't know, $12 or something like that and try it out and see what happens. But, um, but I'll report back on how that works. And I actually have some other drum things that I'll share in the next episode too. I have some, oh. some cool little, uh, little tools that I've been using. So, uh, that, that help, but, um, but I'll share those when we, when we circle back again sometime, but if anybody has any thoughts about uh, why a snare drum would would jump out uh, of the mix, completely different from how it sounds on the stage, that I would love your uh, I'd love your thoughts because you know I like to learn. So it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Nobody said anything to me about it. I just hear it on these recordings, and it's like, oh, that's not like the snare drum's too loud. It shouldn't be that loud. So oh, well, you know. I don't, I don't like that. I like, I like things to sound like I intended them to sound like now, if, you know, if I intended them to sound like something someone doesn't want to hear, that's different. But if, if it's, in, if it's sounding like what I didn't want it to sound like, then that's a problem. That's really what I'm after here. So 
Love it. Uh, you know, the life of a musician. We're always learning, right? Like there's always something else to learn. And I would say we're always chasing the soundless in our head. Certainly guitar players are always chasing the sound that's in your head, the tone that's in your head, and, you know, the mix that's in your head. Mm-hmm. We're, we're always chasing something. We're always chasing something. That's right. Yeah. And that is one place where in-ears, that it, uh, that it, well, that is one place where in-ears can, can shield you from, from that, right? Like you, you, you have to listen to how it sounds in the room. And that's one of the things I always tell people that are migrating to in-ears initially. So anybody here listening if you're, uh, you know, if you're, if you're making that, that journey, always take a minute and listen, you know, if you're a guitar player, you know, play your guitar in the room before you, uh, you know, before you put your ears in and listen to how you're making it sound in the room. And the same is true for drummers and, uh, and anybody else. And then the other thing I will share for, for, for people making the leap to in ears is remember that you still have to sing and project you will be able to hear yourself even in like the middle of like a death metal cacophony on stage. If you go up to your vocal mic and whisper into it, you will hear it and you will be the only one who hears it. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the microphone and the speakers still work the same way and you have to project into that microphone to get it to really activate and move sound and push that out of the speakers so that everything else can do its job. And it's really easy to forget that you still need to project. You don't want to blot your voice. You don't want to overdo it. And that's a beautiful thing with in-ears is because you can hear yourself, you can, you know, temper that, but you still need to project just the same way that you do when you don't have in-ears in because the audience does not have in-ears in. So right. thinking about the room, I don't know. We'll always, these are the things that, that occupy my mind, my friend. Yep. What else do we have? Anything else? I'm a little burned out because living living through my uh, my struggles this week was uh, was a thing. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot, man. That's a lot to do. Yeah. We will be back in two weeks. I have to take my son to school, so I don't think we're doing a show on Monday. But I'm bringing a microphone with me, Paul. If something comes up and we should do an episode, it is possible. So you know, we'll see where well, we. Well, safe travels and uh, good luck to your son for another great year of school. Yeah, that's uh, that's the idea. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it all works out. Thanks for listening, everybody. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. If you have any thoughts, advice, tips, tricks, or if you just want to tell us something, what's something we could tell them? Always be performing. There it is. <laughs>